Hey and welcome to another adventure in the FE Civil Review. So tonight we're going to get started and we are going to go ahead with uh, a structural analysis. So actually in the FE Review there's a couple things going on here. So what you can see here is actually this is the structural engineering section. We're, we're sort of staying on the structures topic. So we've already done statics and strength or mechanics and materials depending on what you call it. But right now we're going to jump in and we're going to go ahead and we're just going to kind of keep going with structural engineering. And, and the way that I see this is I kind of break it into two sections. Normally in a civil engineering uh, program, you're going to be taking like a structural analysis type of course. And then you're going to take some design level courses on top of that as well. So like concrete or steel design. And some of you won't take concrete or steel design. So we'll get to that uh, next week. But this week what we're going to do is we are going to jump in. Uh, some structural analysis problems. So if you don't have the problems yet, uh, take a look at the link below and there's access to those problems or the a PDF that you can follow along with. And you can print those out or do them on the screen or in a notebook, uh, whatever you like. But we will just get started here and hopefully this makes a little bit of sense because what we're going to be looking at is the statically determinant beams, columns, trusses and frames. And a lot of this is kind of a carryover from a statics class. So similar things that you'd be looking at uh, in statics, but it takes it a, a little bit further. Maybe the next step, uh, maybe it helps you to see it a little bit, a little bit more advanced. And, and we'll go into deflections, and we'll do a couple different methods here. Uh, we'll look at the principle of virtual work kind of briefly for for trusses. We'll look at some basic beams and and, and those sorts of things. We'll get into columns. Columns is interesting because actually there's some column formulas in the mechanics and materials section of the review handbook, but it shows up here in the structural engineering piece and even some indeterminate structures we'll take a look at. We're not going to get into like super crazy, like uh, really long and complicated processes, but we will take a look at some of the ones that are in the manual and go from there. So with that, with that being said, hey, if you have comments, um, drop them in the box and we will just get started here. So, ooh, so we went too, a little too far here, but all right, the first question, this looks an awful lot like a statics question that maybe we saw the last time. But what this reads is the axial force in member EC. So what are we looking for? We're looking for member EC. So right here, this this member here, um, the axial force in that member due to the applied loads shown in the truss below is most nearly. So to remember with trusses, we're not dealing with self weight. We're going to ignore the self weight. And what we're going to do is we're just going to take a look at that one member. So this truss is a little bit more complicated than some of the ones we've looked at. Whether, you know, some of the trusses will have parallel cords and what you can see here is these, you know, top cord and bottom cord, they're not parallel. So it, it makes it a little bit more complicated. You can't just do uh, some of forces in a Y direction or X direction to get a component. Here you really kind of have to use uh, the sum of moments formula. And I like this question for a number of reasons. One, because it, it really focuses you in on that some, uh, some moments question. But two, if you think about it right, and you start to understand trusses a little bit better, it, it's going to help you with this process of solving them. So with the, this is going to use the method of sections. And to do the method of sections, what I like to do is I like to kind of draw a section around a part of it. And, and the reason I'm drawing the right side is just because it looks simpler to me. Okay, so the right side looks a little bit simpler. Simpler. I kind of like this little this little truss in here, right? Uh, and you know, it just looks a little bit a little bit simpler. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first just draw a free body diagram of that, and then we're going to take a look at it again. So I'm just going to copy this down here and to draw my free body diagram. All I'm doing is kind of redrawing this thing, uh, and I'm not probably drawing it perfectly here, but just redraw on that section. And what I like to do is just take that, the yellow triangle first, right? So we have what C, uh, D and F, uh, add back the forces that are known. So we have maybe 20 kips here. And we know that we're gonna have some reaction, uh, D, Y at a roller. So there's gonna be some vertical reaction at a roller. And then what I like to do is I like to just always assume tension in trusses. So that way, if I get a negative value, I know it's compression. Uh, but what I like to do here is I'm just going to start in and I'm just going to draw my forces that I don't know. So I'm going to draw EF. I'll draw uh, CE. And I will draw BC. So this is kind of the basic free body diagram. And that's kind of step one. Uh, when you're getting into trusses. So, you know, that's where we're going to uh, get started with with this. 
And then what we have to take a step back is, okay, so we're still trying to find this force, this CE force. So what I like to do whenever I get a, 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 a question like this is to look for one of two things. One, is there a parallel top and bottom chord? Because if so, then I can just use some of the forces and find components. If not, what I like to do next is I'm just going to come back here and, and get a couple colors. So uh, what I what I like to do next is kind of look and see, are there any points of intersection of the unknown forces that are going to be a convenient place to take a moment? So in other words, I'm going to draw a line right through EF. That red line I just drew on the screen, that's a line through EF. That's kind of the line of action of EF. That's the line that EF is passing through and that's where it's acting. And similarly, I like to draw one through BC. And when you do that, when you're doing method of sections, this is actually a really cool thing because what you see all of a sudden is there's a point of intersection there. And that point of intersection is an important point because that point is going to tell us where we can sum moments effectively. So for this question, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to sum my moments about point D. Okay, so if I sum moments, and this is just a sigma moment about point D equals zero, and it's funny, I was, I was showing some of this stuff to my, uh, my sister-in-law who's a, who's a uh, algebra teacher. She teaches algebra like all day, every day. She's like, Mark, that looks like Greek, and it is Greek. Uh, there's a sigma, but it's, she 100% has the algebra. She just, it's like, if, and you guys, you, I know you have the algebra too. The algebra is not the hard part. The hard part is writing these equations and using these weird letters and putting them into, into practice. But all that we're doing here is the moment equation. We're looking for a force times a distance and trying to figure out what forces cause moments. So right away, what we can see is there's a couple forces that don't pass through point D. This, this 20 kips and our force CE. So those two forces have to balance each other rotationally in this in this uh, free body diagram when we sum moments about point D. Anytime I'm summing moments, I can apply that force, you know, that force, that unknown force like CE, for example, anywhere along its line of action. In other words, if I put a rope on that and pulled it somewhere, I could put that anywhere along its line of action and it will cause the same moment. So if I take that force, for example, right? And I say, well, what's its line of action look like? It looks like maybe this green line and you'll see that green line doesn't pass through point D and that's important because if I put that force CE anywhere along that line it's going to create the same moment about uh, about point D anywhere along that line so so I can go anywhere along this line here and that force CE is going to create the same moment so what I like to do I mean if I knew what this perpendicular distance was uh, that would be great if I knew that perpendicular distance I could solve for it directly I don't know that perpendicular distance. I could probably do some geometry and figure it out. But but the, what I see here, what I see is a little bit easier, is I can just take that force and kind of bring it down to this point. And now I can apply uh, some components. So I can apply like maybe CEY and CEX. Why is that important? Because what you see is CEX passes through point D. So we're left with kind of one component here that we can solve directly. So when I some of my moments, I'm gonna say, well, CEY times its moment arm. So its moment arm is going to go from this point E to point D. And if these are eight feet on center, that's going to be a total of eight times two or 16 feet. Right. In which way is that, which way is that causing rotation? That's causing rotation kind of in this direction that matches our positive sign convention. This is going to be a positive value. Okay. And what else do we have? We have, we have plus 20 kips, All right? So here's our 20 kips that's in a positive sign direction as well or a positive rotation as well uh that's causing rotation this direction and what's its moment arm well it's the the force times the perpendicular distance the perpendicular distance from its line of action to point d is this horizontal distance of eight feet so i can put that in here this is times uh eight feet and all that has to equal zero those two forces have to balance each other and you'll notice I wrote EC up here and in CE down here. It's the same force. And sorry for any confusion on that, but CE, EC, it's the same force. And uh, now we can solve and we can solve specifically for CEY. So we can CEY and, and what we'll get here is a negative value. But if I put that in the calculator, what do I get? I get 20 uh, times 8 divided by 16. And that gives me a value of negative uh, 10 kips.
So you might be tempted to say, okay, next, <laughs> we got 10 kips. I'm happy. I'm just going to move on. But don't do that because that's just one component. That's the vertical component. And what we want are, uh, or what we want really is, is this total force here. So we want this total kind of resultant force here, which is CE or EC, however you want to do it. So to look at that, what we have to do next is kind of take a look at, at this this whole triangle up here so if we take a look at this whole triangle right this whole triangle here is gonna is gonna help us to relate the component to the main force so the way i like to show that is by saying okay we know we have this triangle here right in this triangle between e uh, f and c we have some dimensions so the dimensions we have we know this is eight feet we know this is six feet and uh, I'm a sucker for six, eight, and 10 triangles. So you'll have to forgive me for that, but this is a six, eight, 10 triangle. Okay, and what that means is that's going to mimic or match our force triangle. So if we have this force here and we have some components, right? And maybe I'll go back to saying this is EC just to, uh, just to be more consistent with what the problem says up here, EC. So ECY, ECX, and force, all together EC right that's what we're trying to find here right so we're trying to find that EC and now this is just a similar triangle thing because I know that this angle and this angle are exactly the same so if we have similar triangles what we could do is well we could write well I know what do I know I know EC right and I know ECY so if I know those I can say well EC I don't know EC I'm sorry EC is the one I'm trying to find EC over ECY has to equal what? It has to equal essentially 10 over, over six, right? So when we have this here, what we can see is all to get EC, all we really have to do is, is cross multiply and we get EC equal to 10 over six times ECY. And when I did this out earlier, I think I got like 16.67, right? So 16.67 tips. Okay, so the cool thing with this problem is we didn't even have to do that reaction. I mean, gut level, first thing I do a lot of times when I see trusses like this is I'm going to, well, I'm going to go solve for dy. But on the FE, every minute that you can save is going to help you get to another problem where maybe you can't save it. Okay, <laughs> it's a little bit more difficult. So if you can save not doing those reactions, you know, it saves you, it saves you a few seconds there and that's going to help you. But this should be our answer which fortunately is up here in our answers as well so i hope that one makes sense i mean it's just taking another look at trusses I'm trying to introduce method of sections a number of times here uh, method of joints but um hopefully this makes a little bit of sense and also hopefully it makes sense that we can apply right we can apply this moment anywhere or i'm sorry we can apply this force anywhere along its line of action and it's going to equal the same moment. And just again, I don't. I'm trying not to confuse people. This can be ECX or CEX. It's the same same thing, right? It's it's that's not divided by E. You know, these are the same things. I'm not trying to like uh, mess with people with uh, different notations here. I probably should have kept this at ECX and ECY. So hopefully that's not confusing. But uh, I don't know if you have questions. Definitely put them in the chat, or we can uh, you know keep going here. But we'll just keep moving. So. Uh, this is good. So let's go to question number two. Again, we're in this analysis of statically determined beams, columns, trusses, and frames. So this is, you know, we just did a truss. Now we're into this kind of beam frame type thing where we get the impact of two members connected by a pin. And we have to look at what's one member going to do to the other member. So, so one member is going to have an impact on the other member right so this this you know this top member here is going to have an impact on you know this member here so these are connected by a pin in the middle and what that means is in order to solve this question right this question asks for a moment reaction at point a right so down here right, down here point a um the moment reaction at point a due to the applied loads is most nearly so what is it how do we get it uh well what we're going to do here is first we're going to separate this thing out and um we, we realize well maybe we could take a look at this first but there's too many unknowns there's too many things that we don't know like if we if we were just to just draw a free body diagram of this thing you know we'd have a y and uh, a x 
and uh, see why. And you can't forget this one, right? This is at a fixed support. You have the moment today. If we were just to some moments at this point, we'd have too many unknowns. We'd have the moment today and we'd have CY. So we can't just do that directly. And whenever you get problems like this that are, uh, you know, separate or that have multiple members um, joined by a pin, that's where we have to separate them out. So what we're going to do here is we're just going to start with uh, member BC. So I'm going to just draw in member BC here. And when I draw member BC, right, I've got this load. That's two kips per foot. And hopefully a uniformly loaded simply supported beam is something you've seen before, right? So this is one of those one of those ones that honestly, when I was in consulting and we'd interview people, I'm, I would ask somebody, some some people this question. What's the maximum moment? What's the maximum shear in this type of a beam? A uniformly loaded simply supported beam. It's one of those things, if you know it's just W all over two, it's really easy. If you if even if you don't know that, if you know the symmetry here. Right, and this is 10 feet. It, two times 10 is 20 kips, right? So we get a, a total kind of resultant force here of 20 kips. If you know that, hopefully you, you don't have to do a lot of work here to get that CY and BY are both going to equal 10 kips, right? That's the, you know, BY equals CY equals what WL over two. We'll take a look at that a little bit later to the beam diagram. If you don't remember what it is, I um, mean, again, if you don't remember what it is, that's okay. You could also find it by just summing moments about point B equal to zero, right? If we did that, we'd get, you know, minus 20 kips times the five feet. So what's, where's the five feet come from? That's this five feet, right? So that's the moment arm. Uh, and uh, then we're going to what? We're going to add CY times 10 feet. So either way, when, we, when we're all said and done, we should get a value of CY equals, well, 20 divided by 2 is going to equal uh, 10 kips. So that's kind of the starting point. Once we have that, uh, what we have to do is we have to take a look at these pin reactions, right? This BX and BY. So I sort of left those over here for a second. So we have BY and we have BX. So when I separate this, this piece at, at, at the pin, what I'm doing is I'm kind of exposing these forces. You'll notice I, I, I didn't show the forces here to start because I didn't separate that piece apart, but as soon as I separate it out, that's when I have to show these forces. That's when they kind of show up, right? The, the, the forces balance if the pin is connected. Once the pin's not connected, they no longer balance, and that's where we have to add them in. So what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna take a free body diagram of this other member here, of a member AB. So if I take a look at AB, this is where I still have, you know, I still have my 21 kips, Right, my 21 kips acting here. Yeah, I'll get a one in there. Uh, and this is at five feet from the support. Okay, so I got my 21 kips, but the question is what other, what else do we have going on here? We still know we have AX. We still know we have AY. We still know we have the moment at A. And this is where equal and opposite side, or sides of a pin will have equal and opposite reactions, right? So we have to deal with the, the, those forces, the BX and BY forces that are in that pin, right? But when we show them, you know, up and to the left, or I'm sorry, up and, that's the right, up and to the right here, right? Up and to the right here. On the other side of the pin, we have to show them down. So what's this, BY? and you know to the left bx so on opposite sides of pins the forces are equal and opposite so don't forget that um, we never solved this but we could come back up here and we could say well if we sum forces in the x direction equal to zero right put my sign convention in there just for for completeness but what we have here is we're just going to get bx equals zero right so if, if if c is a roller bx has to be zero so that's just going to be uh, zero as well. So what we know here is I'm just going to take this and eh, I'll leave it in there for now. I'll, I'll just call it, I'll call it zero, right? So this equals zero and BY equals, what do we get? We got BY to equal to 10 kips. So now this is just a sum of moments equation and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to find the moment reaction at point A. So now what I can do here is I can sum moments at point A and if I do that, uh, I'm just going to sum my moments at point A, make that equal to zero. 
And what do I get? I get, you, you have to remember <laughs> your mother. Uh, you have to remember Ma, right? Your, your mother, your mother, your, well, the moment of day is, is a moment of day. You got to remember that one. It's there. Don't forget about it. Um, and honestly, when you're done with this, go give your mom a ring and just say, hey, mom, thanks. I, I love you. I'm so glad you, you, you believe the best of me. Sorry, that was just an aside. That has nothing to do with the FE, but um, it's just a piece of advice, you know? So as we go through there, what we're going to do is we're going to some moments at point A, well, forces don't pass through point A. Uh, again, we have some couple forces here. We have the 21 kips and we have BY. And a moment is what? A moment is equal to a force times a perpendicular distance. So the cool thing here is the 21 kips, I probably could have put this in the problem statement. I probably have said that this is perpendicular, but I'll tell you now. That force is perpendicular to member AB. And if that's perpendicular, the cool thing is we already have this moment arm. We already have the perpendicular distance. So the moment of A is going to be 21 kips times, or I'm sorry, the moment of A is going to be, uh, we're going to subtract off uh, 21 kips times this 5 feet. And then the only other force here is this BY, and we have to figure out its moment arm. So what I'm going to do is, if I kind of extend the line here, its line of action is going to have a moment arm a perpendicular moment arm from point A to its line of action of, well, ah, shoot, we don't even have this, right? We know six and 10, and there's my favorite one again, right? That favorite triangle of mine where we have a six, uh, eight, 10 triangle. So three, four, five, six, eight, 10. I'd have to think to, to go even higher, but uh, it, it's, it's some of these um, Pythagorean theorem type triangles. If you have, you know, the, the hypotenuse in one side, you should be able to find the other. Okay, so a squared plus b squared equals c squared type of thing. Okay, so that's going to give us our moment times our, or our force times our perpendicular distance is going to give us our moment. So we got the minus one times five. And then we also know that this uh, distance here is that eight feet. So what, the, what does that mean? Uh, we're going to subtract off as well by times eight feet. That's going to equal zero. So the good news is we, we basically have one equation, one unknown, and if we're summing moments about point A, that, those are the only two things that cause a moment about point A. So we get the moment at A uh, equal to what? 21 times five, uh, you know, plus uh, BY, which is 10 times eight. So if I do that on my calculator, hopefully we get an answer, but I, I, I think we do. So we get 21 times five, I think that's 105. Yeah, so 105 uh, kip feet plus 80. Uh, kip feet. So that's going to equal 185 uh, kip feet. Okay. And that's our answer, right? So that's the answer that we're looking for here. But with, with frames, what you're going to have to do is you, you're going to need to separate them probably at that internal pin. So that internal pin is something you have to deal with. Uh, and then what you're going to have to deal with is you're going to have to deal with the reactions on each side of it. So on each side of a pin, they're going to be equal and opposite. So when you put that pin back together, those forces cancel out. When you pull them apart, you see them. Okay. So take a look at that. You know, that's, that's one of the things that you're going to have to, to deal with. All right. Okay. Well, let's keep going. So we've got two questions down. I mean, honestly, today's, today's session probably won't be as long as some of the last couple. So hopefully we'll uh, get to bed a little earlier. Who knows? But let's look at this. Deflection of statically determinant beams, columns, trusses, and frames. So now we're to deflection. In the deflection, there's a couple different methods. I mean, some of you probably learned how to integrate and integrate and integrate and integrate until you finally get a, a deflection formula, and you can do that. And, and when you get questions like this that are piecewise, they get annoying. Honestly, they just get um, long and annoying. And there's an easier way. Okay, so the easier way is to come in to your reference handbook here. And in the reference handbook, if we go down to civil engineering, there should be a structural section, right? So we go past geotechnical and eventually we get to the structures section. So this is kind of helpful, uh, except that I think I'm looking in the wrong section <laughs> and it's less helpful there. So we have a couple things. We have a statically indeterminate, you know, we've, we've fixed end moments your structural design, and we think, uh-oh, we missed it. Where are those beam tables? Those beam tables are actually in mechanics and materials, I think. So I, I think I got that wrong. But let's go back here and look. And, and honestly, there are going to be some pieces in structural analysis that go back in, in mechanics and materials. So like I talked about earlier, like the, um, 
the column formulas. The columns columns show up in. Oh, that's what we're looking for. We'll come back to that, but well, we'll come back to it. Let's just do it now. So, so what we see here is we have some beam diagrams, right? And these beam diagrams are going to be what we're going to use. And I just picked one of them. I, I mean, it could it could show up like any of them. This is one of those super common ones. A simply supported uniformly loaded beam, five WL to the fourth over three D four EI. The maximum moments WL squared over eight. That's not the one we're using, but I pointed it out just because it's a super, uh, it's a super common one. You know, and you might be tempted to look at this and say, "Oh, that's the same loading we have, and it's half the span." But don't use it because it has a, a, a pin on one side and a roller on the other, right? So what we're doing is we're going to come down here, and we're going to look at where we have a cantilever beam, and we have this 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 maximum deflection at its end. So that's what the question asked for, right? So if we come back to the question, we see we have a well, steel flange section bent about a strong axis. It's rigidly connected at support A. So rigid connection means it's resisting rotation. This is a cantilever. And the magnitude of the maximum deflection. So if this thing is going to deflect, it's going to deflect kind of like this. And we're looking for this kind of, I like to use delta. This is going to be like our maximum deflection. The, the reference handbook use that V or new, you know, uh, but, but I, I just like to use this. So what does that mean? So let's come back here and see what else we got. So we got this formula here. We got a maximum deflection and we're going to get seven WL to the fourth over 384 EI. So let's just write that out. And so, so the formula that we're solving here is seven. So our Delta max or our new max is going to equal seven WL to the fourth over 384 EI and I dropped the negative sign because I don't really care so much that this is going down. I mean, I know the load's pushing it down, but you could keep the negative if you want. Um, so let's go. Let's go with it. So let's let, let's go here. Okay. So I just saw a comment. So I'm gonna hit that comment real quick. How come the first two questions aren't just considered statics? They kind of are. <laughs> they kind of are statics. Okay. Uh, and just not to burst your bubble, but they kind of are statics but when we're looking at it okay i'm just gonna come back here for one second when we're looking at analysis of statically determinant structures typically we're just looking at statics it's just maybe a little bit more complicated than it was in your 200 level statics and now this is 300 level and it's a little bit more complicated it's sort of like pre-algebra and algebra you're doing the same things or pre-calculus and calculus you're kind of doing a lot of the same things but sometimes it's a little bit harder in calculus versus pre-calculus statics versus structural analysis. Okay, that's kind of the, the way I'll throw it there. So sorry for seeing that comment late, but let's keep going here. So let's define our variables, right? So our variables here, we have our W and that's gonna be our uniform load. That's just gonna be two kips per foot. Okay, good. Uh, L, well, is L at eight feet or is it 16 feet? Uh, let's go back and take a look and see what that is. So if we come back, and we look at our reference handbook here. Uh, what do we get? We get L. If we look at L, we see L over two is gonna be half the span and L is gonna be uh, the whole span. So uh, let's come back here and look at L is gonna equal the whole span 16 feet. Uh, e, do you know what E is off the top of your head? Um, for a steel beam, hopefully you, you've memorized E. If not, there is that table, I think we just passed over it, right? We looked at this maybe in the mechanics and materials section, but what do we get, right? So for E, uh, if we come down for E steel, we get 29 million PSI. So 29 MPSI. So what do we have? We have 29 MPSI, which is equivalent to 29,000 uh, KSI. Or, I mean, we could say well, this is also equal to 29 million PSI, right? So you have to know your unit conversions there. We got some unit conversions. And then we're going to look at I. And some of you are going to be stumped and saying, like, hey, isn't there a steel manual for that? And the answer is yes, there is. And the other answer is some of these members are actually shown in the the civil engineering section. So if we come back and look at the civil engineering section here, Right, and I come in and I look and I scroll down far enough. Uh, I should be able to find 
We'll come back to Geotech in a couple of weeks. That'll be fun. Um, I should be able to find some sections. So, so you could just do a quick control F. That's probably going to get me there sooner. Oh man, I probably should have done it. So control F would have gotten me there sooner, right? An 18 by 71 though, is I get some values here. So if I look at that, I'm going to zoom in just a little bit here. So what I'm looking for is an 18 by 71. I got that. And I'm looking for I. So I see an I here and an I here. Which one do I, do I use? If it's the strong axis, use the big one. So the strong axis is going to be the X value. So we're going to take the W 18 by 71. Uh, I value here of what's that 1170 okay so 1170 and that's in inches to the fourth did I say units are important uh, maybe not this one this this session so far but units are super important so let's look at our units here as we plug this in so seven times W which is two kips per foot times our length which is 16 feet that's to the fourth Okay, and then I'm going to divide that by 384 E, which is in, uh, since I have kips up on the top, I'm going to use kips on the bottom. I'm going to come back in here and I'm going to say this is going to be times 29,000 kips per square inch. Sometimes I like it, like to, rather than write KSI, I like to write kips per square inch like that because it's easier to, to, to cancel out units, right? So we have the kips per square inch. And what else do we have? We have our I. Our I was 1170 inches to the fourth. Okay, so we have all the numbers, but you'll notice that we have, we have units that are inconsistent. We have feet on the top, we have inches on the bottom. The kips are nice because the kips cancel out. Okay, so the kips cancel out, those are good. But if we just look at units, we've got, we've got feet to the fourth divided by feet. Right, that's our that's our feet to the fourth divided by feet, and then on the bottom we have you know inches squared uh, under. Well, here let me actually let me write it this way. We've got um, inches to the fourth divided by inches squared. So if we keep going, we're going to get feet cubed divided by inches squared. And we see we have to do a conversion. So the conversion that I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply this by what? I know for every one foot I have, my units are in inches. So I'm going to try to get this to inches. For every one foot I have, I have 12 inches. And I'm going to cube that. When I cube that, what happens is this, the, the feet go away. Um, all, you know, all the inches except for one, this kind of gets me to units of inches, right? So the red here is just the, the units, the, the red is just the units, but basically you, what the, the, the long and the short of this is this is, these are kind of like, that's not equal. These are just units, right? So this is just units over here. And if I could spell it, that would even be more helpful. So units, okay. So what we have here is these are these are all our units, but we need to multiply this by 12 cubed in order to get our answer. So once you know the units, this gets a little bit easier. This is a little bit of a maze to go look up the different pieces, whether it's E or it's I or it's the formula in the first place. So you have to be really familiar with that reference handbook to go do this. But if we type this in now, hopefully we get the right answer. So seven times two times 16 to the fourth, right? times 12 to the third, okay? And then divide all that by 384 and divide that by 29,000. I can plug it in right here. And divide that by 1170, which is our moment of inertia. And I get like 0.12. So 0 0.12, uh, 1, 2, it's like 1, 2, 1 or 1, 2, 2. Um, inches. So that's close enough. It's most nearly the 0 0.12. Okay. But this, this brings up that approach to the FE where you have to understand, you have to totally understand where these formulas are, when to go look them up. You have to understand what the units are. Uh, you have to understand kind of where to find uh, your, your E, your modulus elasticity, if you don't just remember it. And you have to know how to find this I value because it, it's not just going to be given. I mean, maybe it'll be given to you if they do give it to you. That's even better than you don't have to go find it. But there it is. All right. 
Question three is done. Okay, let's keep going because we got another deflection one. And for those of you that took structural analysis with me, you guys are going to grow and you're like, principle of virtual work. Oh man, that's terrible. Okay, it can be terrible. <laughs> it can be, it can be complicated. But I've, you know, I've been surprised sometimes talking to people where, where, you know, they'll take FE concepts that I think are too complicated to throw on the exam, but they'll take them and throw them on the exam and try to make them less complicated, okay? So, uh, so we'll go from there. So, so let's take a look at this one, right? So, ah, man, I keep seeing comments a little bit late here. I'll try to keep a better eye on it. Uh, but thanks, Mike, for jumping in there. The x-axis, right? Um, if we're if we're bent about its strong axis, that's i-x. So strong axis is i-x. There you go. Strong axis is i-x. Always uh, for for what we're doing in this this uh, for this test. Let's come back here though. Principle of virtual work for trusses. Deflection in trusses. They say one of the one of the requirements here is that deflection is statically determinate. Trusses. Okay. Uh, we kind of did columns last time with that PL over AE formula. If you remember the PL over AE formula, we had a couple members that in the mechanics and materials section, and we said, well, what force will cause this thing to deflect a certain amount? So that's kind of like a column of PL over AE. And the trusses is honestly very similar. You got a lot of little columns connected by joints. So let's go to the principle of virtual work here and see what that looks like. So if we come back to our, our reference handbook here, uh, what we'll see here is actually, I'm going to keep coming back past steel components back into our structural analysis section. So if I come back all the way to structural analysis section, uh, there's determinacy. We'll come back to determinacy in a little bit here, but I want to just keep coming here. And this is frame deflection using the unit load method. Again, this is more kind of, uh, this is more calculus and inter integrations. This is kind of a, a, a follow up to the question we're doing. So this is a little, little bit more complicated than the question we're doing here. But the question we're doing here is going to take a look at the trust deflection by the unit load method. So this is a similar type of thing. But instead of using integrate integrals, we're using a summation. It, it makes it a little bit easier, it makes it a little bit more doable. But what we see here is a big formula and you might see this formula and just say, Flag, I'm moving on and uh, not even uh, not even try to solve it. But on a CVC a principle of virtual work uh, problem uh, for a truss or deflection in a truss or something like this, it's probably going to be actually a fairly simple truss or a fairly easy problem in the sense that there's going to be a lot of zero force members to make the analysis doable in a short amount of time. So what we see here is this is this. Uh, is this formula of we have a delta of a joint so displacement of a joint is equal to the summation of fi which is the force in the member caused by a unit load like a one kilonewton load here the times delta li so delta li remember the pl over a formula from last time this is fl over ae it's the same thing but f is the force instead of p right so we have this f times fl over ae okay so the um so so yeah i mean this kind of gets in there principle virtual works a little it's it's it works kind of the same way um but yeah we're not going to get into all that there is i do, does this have a principle virtual work section i'm trying to think uh if i if i remember in here correctly we uh, i don't remember i'd have to search um but why don't i why don't i for jewel uh, work. Ooh, sorry, I can't spell today. Actually, my keyboard's off to the side, so it, there is no principle of virtual work. This is essentially a principle of virtual work. Okay, so it's just that that's where we're going with it. Okay, so um, so let's just jump in here and we'll we'll take a look at what this looks like. Okay, so 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 let me come back over. Let me come back over here. Um, what we have is a, a formula that essentially says the delta equals the sum of little f, you know, big F, L over AE. Okay, so we need to sum that. So we, we need to find a couple of things. And this is where um, the little f is the force uh, based on a unit load. Um, big F is the force 
uh, based on uh, the actual loads. Okay, uh, it, the L is the length of the member, A is the area, and E is uh, the modulus of elasticity. All right, so with this, we have to find a couple things, but what we can see here is, is right, off the, right off the bat, we see, well, if we put, what are we trying to find? We're trying to find, we have, well, we have a truss. We're given five centimeter by five centimeter squared members with a modulus elasticity of 200,000. So this question, the modulus elasticity is just given, okay? Ignore the self-weight, truss, ignore self-weight. Assume compression members are braced against buckling, so we're not getting weird things going on, and you don't have to evaluate it for buckling. Um, the magnitude of the horizontal displacement at point D due to the applied loads is most nearly. So anytime we're doing this, what we're gonna do is we're gonna put like a unit load at that point. So we're gonna put this like one kilonewton load uh, at that point. And, and first we're gonna analyze it like that. And if we do that, um, I'm just gonna throw, throw a couple things out there real quick. So do you remember zero force members? Zero force members could totally show up on the exam as well, uh, but but zero force members here. If if you remember, like let's just let's just take a walk down zero force member lane for a minute. So if we look at like joint C for example, okay, joint C, um, we have a couple of forces coming out of joint C. Well, this would be like CD and like uh, AC. If you just look at joint C, um, basically what we have going on here is we've got joint C and, and if you take a look at this, um, we're looking to see that the sum of the forces in the Y direction equals zero, the sum of the forces in the X direction equals zero. We can see from the Y that AC equals zero. We can see from the X that CD um, also equals uh, zero. Okay, so we can see both of those, right? So, so hopefully that makes sense and isn't too crazy. But what that tells us here is that this is zero force, this is a zero force. Similarly, if we look at, you know, joint B at the bottom here, if we look at joint B, right, if we look at joint B and this is what, joint uh, B, um, we're gonna have some reaction at B, right? This is gonna be like B, Y. Uh, we'll probably have like a B, D, and then here we're gonna have like A, B. But if you remember, I mean, hopefully you don't have to go through these free body diagrams on the FE. I'm doing this here just to kind of refresh your memory about zero force members, right? Do, do you remember zero force members? Zero force uh, members, right? So this is where hopefully you can remember some of these things. But um, what you can see here is if we sum forces in the X direction equals zero, um, A, B equals zero. Okay, so, so basically same thing going on here. And what does that mean so that means we have a force here that's zero so there's only two forces in this truss that are going to have to you know have to hold or i'm sorry there are only two members in this truss that are going to have to hold force so we have uh, ad and db okay so hopefully just from remembering a few things about zero force members you can go ahead and you can take a look at these members and just say oh you know not having to do this whole kind of like analysis here um you can go ahead and solve and say okay i know those are zero force members i really only need to solve for these two forces so if we do that what we're going to do here is we're going to take that joint what joint do we have left we have joint let's look at joint d and i'm going to put my one kilonewton force here and I'm going to have my force, what's this? This is maybe called AD and force uh, AB. I'm going to put AB up because I kind of know it's in compression. But let's take a look at the geometry here and see if you guys can do this, maybe in your head a little bit even. But if we take a look at this thing going on, what do we have? We have the sum of the forces in the x direction equals zero. Right, so what do we get? We get this component ADX has to equal, essentially ADX has to equal one kilonewton. Do you see it? These two forces have to be equal horizontally. And then this truss got even easier because we have a four, four triangle. So I tried to make this kind of easy so the math wasn't too crazy. You didn't have to go do geometry to relate components. Um, here, hopefully you can see, um, since it's a, you know, a, a, a 45 degree, you know, triangle, 
that means that means what? It means a d y also equals one kilonewton. Okay, I'll get my head out of the way. Um, right? I mean, can you just can you can you do that without me having to write it down? I hope so. And hopefully that means now once we have that, we can say some of the forces in the y direction equals zero, and we can say well a b, you know a b equals a d y equals one kilonewton. Right, so this trust the the analysis of this trust everything just equals one. I, I mean it's it's kind of a simplified version here, but hopefully it makes a little bit of sense, right? I mean basically the horizontal forces have to balance, so the one kilonewton balances the ADX. The the vertical and horizontal components of AD have to be the same. I should probably label this one here AD why they have to be the same. So since they have to be the same. That means you know they both have to be one. Then A, B, and A, D, Y, they're the only two vertical forces, so they each have to be one. So again, trust analysis, but we're taking it a little bit further here. Okay. The last thing that I want to do is with that 40 feet 5 degree triangle, we also can solve for AD, and that's just going to equal the, the square root of 2 uh, kilonewton. So 1 times the square root of 2. Okay. Once we have that, okay, once we have that, we can take a look up here. And what we see is, What's the difference between the free body diagram we just drew and the, the so this is for like little forces fi, right? So that's for little forces fi. What's the difference between that one and you know if we have AD 70 kilonewtons and AB? Do you see the only difference is multiplied by 70? Right, so once you solve it once for one of these, as long as all the, there's only one load, it makes it really easy. If there's only one load, it's it's super easy, and I say super easy. You don't have to go reanalyze it. So this, you know, th this is essentially if we have F I capital F I, right? So this is the this is the big oops, this is the big load here, right? F I is just going to equal seventy times little F I. Is that okay? And because it's all the same geometry and it's all the same except for the, the magnitude of the load. Okay, so if we're if we're doing the unit load, the principal virtual work here for trusses, what are we gonna do? We're gonna say that we I'm just gonna make a table. I'm gonna say F I F I uh and then what else do we have? We have what's our formula? It's F F L over A E. So I'm just gonna do F F L and then F F L. So I'm just going to I'm going to leave AE out for a second. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to do one for each member and I'm ah that didn't look good so I'm just going to rewrite it here for a second. F capital F L. So what members do we have? We have two members. Basically we have a member a member I'll just write it here. AD and AB. Right, so we have two members. AD, we said little fi, right? So little fi AD was going to be the square root of 2. And big F I is going to be 70 squared to 2. And then the length, right, the length, if we have a 4 4 triangle, this length is going to be 4 squared to 2. Okay. So let's come down here. So 4 squared to 2. And if we multiply all that out, what do we get? We get 70 times 4 times 2 times the square root of 2. Did I do that right? I got like 791 or 792 roughly, okay? If I multiply all that out. AB, AB, what's AB? Well, AB we said was one, we said was 70. We said the, the, the height here, that height is gonna be just the four meters, right? So what's the height? It's gonna be uh, four, so four times 70, what's that, 280? I, I, I believe so, if I can still do math at, so if I add those two together, 792 uh, plus 480 or 280, I'm sorry, I get about 1072 for FFL. And, and somebody's out there is wondering, well, what about A and E? Well, A and E are constant, so I'm not going to put those into my my sum here. I'm gonna I'm gonna do those afterwards. So let's do this out, and we'll we'll plug in the equation. So so here's kind of where that principle of virtual work comes in. We're doing one times uh, delta. It is going to equal one kilonewton times delta equals what? It equals the sum of F, F, L over AE. And since AE is constant, we can pull this out. So now I'm just going to write this in. 
So what's that sum? This sum is right here. It's going to be 1072. And if you look at the units, I'm going to have kilonewtons squared uh, times meters. And now I'm going to divide. And what am I dividing by? Well, I'm given centimeters and megapascals. So what units do you want to use? The units that I'm going to use here, or I'm going to say, well, I'm going to say, well, I'm just going to translate this to millimeters. And I'm going to say uh, 50 millimeters times 50 millimeters times 200,000 megapascals. Megapascals is a newton per millimeter squared. Okay, so let's see if I can do my units right. And uh, so what do I need to do here? I need to I need to figure a couple units out. So um, let me just make sure I'm doing my units right because I think I screwed something up. Did I screw something up? Maybe. I might have screwed up units here. So let's just take a look. Let's see what we got. Um, the kilonewtons go away. Right, so if I'm just going to cross things out, the kilonewtons go away. I get one kilonewton to go away. Uh, what else do I need to do? Well, now I have the millimeters squared go away. And I've got some inconsistencies with my units. So I've got a kilonewton on the top, a newton on the bottom. I've got a meter on the top. And if we're looking here, we want our deflection or displacement in millimeters. So I want to convert everything to millimeters. So I'm going to come back down here. And what I want to do here is I want to get rid of that kilonewton. So I'm going to multiply times for every um, 1,000 newtons. I'm going to have one kilonewton. So my kilonewtons are going to cancel out. Uh, my newtons are going to cancel out. And then what else do I have? I have 1,000 millimeters per one meter. Okay, so is this a long problem? Yeah, it is. It's a long problem. But it hits on some fundamental principles, right? The fundamental principles are like units. Do you know units? Do you know how to apply some of these more complicated methods in structural analysis? And can you put them into your calculator and take the basic trust analysis and apply uh, something that's a little bit more complicated here. So if we type 1072 times a thousand squared, you know, divided by 50, divided by 50, divided by 200,000, I get uh, 2.144 millimeters. So I get my delta equal to 2.14 uh, millimeters, which should match one of these up here. So in theory, this matches our two millimeters. It's most closely related to that. Okay, so is this problem going to be on there? I don't know, maybe, maybe not. Uh, could I see a problem like this where instead of having the load be, you know, horizontal, it, the load is maybe vertical? Uh, I, I could see that. Why, why is that? That, that question's even easier. Because when you look at this question, this goes to zero, this is zero, this is zero. They're all zero force members except for one member here. And then this just simplifies to what it's it, it simplifies to like a PL over AE problem. So like column, right? I mean, it's that's where it's like it could get it could get simpler, right? And this isn't the problem we have, you know. It, this isn't the problem that that um, we were given, you know, in this problem statement. But is it something that FE could give you? Sure, why not? It's that same idea of like, I'm going to give you something that looks really complicated, but once everything goes to zero, it makes it a little bit less complicated, a little bit more doable in that five minutes. But if you understand the fundamentals of that trust analysis, the zero force members, this that's going to help you a ton. Oh, man, that was that was um, quite the problem, you know, but let's just let's keep going. If you have questions, let me know. But hopefully this is helpful as, as well. Just remember in zero force members, remember that like, you know, principal virtual work kind of thing, the, the, the unit load uh, type of thing. So let's keep moving so we are on to question five and this goes into column analysis buckling boundary conditions um probably when we get into steel analysis we'll get more into columns as well but this one kind of just shows shows up and says we have a bar it's uses a column to resist axial forces and compression uh the column is solid steel so we, we get we get that um you know e thinking in the back of our head what's e um, for centimeters, it's going to be that 200. Oh, good. They give it to us. This is a cross section of two centimeters by six centimeters and modulus elasticity 200. It's simply supported at its end for both a strong and weak axis. So we have simple supports at both ends. 
okay? And then in the weak axis, it's braced at the midpoint as well. Okay, only in the weak axis and, and not in the strong axis, okay? So what's the theoretical Euler buckling load that will cause the bar to buckle? Okay, so this is where you kind of need to know what those, uh, those, those, those formulas are, right? So if we come back, and this is where, this is a great one for, the, for uh, control F. So if I just start to type in buckle, there's lateral torsional buckling, uh, and honestly, I'm going to go to previous and look here. So, so if we have columns, uh, if you kind of know how this, this works, we have columns. We get a critical axial load for long column subject to buckling. Euler's formula is P critical, pi squared EI over KL squared. The other thing that I'll throw out here is you get pi squared EI, or I'm sorry, pi squared E over KL over R squared. Sometimes that KL over R is also known as the slenderness ratio. You have to know what R is. R is the radius of gyration. It's just the square root of I over A. So that might be asked as well, like it's radius of gyration. You might be given a critical buckling stress instead of a critical buckling load. You kind of have to use one equation or the other. But let's go here and we will take a look at that. So we got PCR is pi squared EI over KL squared. Okay, so we'll come back here and we get, ooh, I'm just gonna write that down, PCR equals pi squared EI over KL squared. And the nice thing for you is when you're taking the FE, you're gonna have the handbook on one side, you're gonna have your work kind of in front of you on your little, you know, tablet thing that you get to write on. And then you'll have your problems on the other side that you get to work through as well. So this is our PCR. So so we we already we're given E, right? So we're given uh, we're given E. So E we know is 200 GPA. Uh, we don't know K. We have to go look up K. We kind of have these L values here uh, that we can use. And specifically, L is going to change depending on which axis you're at. So if we're looking at like the weak axis, uh, let me. Uh, let's 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 just draw it down here. Why not? So if we're looking at the weak axis, right? We know that the the unbraced length, this L C Y, the unbraced length, uh, you can call it L C Y, you can call it L Y. It's probably L Y is a better uh, term for it. But L Y, the unbraced length is going to be 1.5 meters. Right? The length between bracing points is just that 1.5 meters. Similarly, uh, L X, right? So we have L X. Uh, I'm sorry. Actually, let me come over to uh, let me let me come back here for a second and I'm just going to do the strong axis on this side okay so similarly over here the strong axis we have LX and this is where we get that total length we get the total length which is three meters because it's 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 braced at three meters okay we need to think about KY and KX, right? And this is where hopefully you kind of remember what that is, but this is kind of that uh, effective length factor. So if we're looking at how these things are gonna buckle, we're gonna have this buckling and kind of a bow shape, right? So we're gonna have a bow shape here, but but for the weak axis, we're gonna bow, but it's gonna, it's gonna come back on itself here. So it's gonna go through uh, that bracing point. So for the, the strong axis, there is no extra bracing point. It's just going to be braced right at both of the pins, right? So, but for the weak axis, it's going to be braced at these, these three points here. So we have to look up the effective length factors. And if we come back to our reference handbook, let's see if we have them. Let's see if we, if we can find them here. So, um, you know, if we look at this, we have K, which, uh, my computer's not liking me today, so let's let's uh, see if I can fix that. Uh, or maybe it's just okay. I don't know. The k what we have here is theoretical effective length factors. Pin pin is going to be k equal to one. Fixed pin 0.5 or fixed fix fix six point five. Fixed pin you know 0.7 two. But effectively, what we have here is we have pinned pinned for both of them, right? So if 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 we think of a pin, what's a pin? Pin allows free rotation. It, al it allows free rotation. So at, at, at this point and at this point, we have free rotation. So we're gonna say K equal to uh, 1.0. Uh, similarly over here, we have free rotation at both ends and KX is gonna be 1.0. So we got the K, we got the L. We know that E already, we said E was, well, E was 200. Uh, GPA, which is equal to 200,000 megapascals, 
Okay, however, whatever units you like. And, and then what else do we need? We need I. So let's come to strong axis and weak axis. I equals, you know, IY. This goes back to that question that came up kind of earlier. What's strong axis? What's weak axis? Well, the strong is the one where I essentially get the bigger H value, right? So it's like, it depends on how you're going to buckle this thing, but the bigger H value. So if we come back to our... Uh, our mechanics and materials section in here, or, or well, actually, this is civil engineering now. But if we come back to our mechanics and materials section, we have some values here for uh, for moment of inertia, and we kind of went over this in the mechanics and materials section. But it's worth doing again because it shows up uh, when we get to actually, it's in the static section. Oh man, I, I missed that one. This this is in static section. Moment of inertia is in the static centroids, uh, centroids, masses, areas, lengths, and volumes right this is where we have a standard value here and we have ix is base times height cubed so the, the big height here versus iy is the base cubed times the height okay so in other words when we come back here we're going to see the general rectangle formula here is base height i equals base height cubed over 12 so when we go to the weak axis we want the smaller moment of inertia so what's this going to be it's going to be six times two cubed over 12. and honestly i'm gonna I, i'm just gonna make the commitment now i'm just gonna make the commitment and i'm gonna say rather than do that i'm gonna say if this is what do i have if two centimeters by six centimeters i'm gonna say um tw i'm sorry i'm gonna say I'm going to just convert everything to millimeters. I, I just, I'm going to say 60 millimeters times 20 millimeters cubed. And that's going to give me this value here, right? So 60 times 20 to the 3 uh, over 12. Uh, what do I get? I get about 40,000. And so 40,000 uh, millimeters to the fourth. Okay. And then we can do the same thing for the strong axis, but for the strong axis, the H is going to be the one that makes it bigger. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to say this equals to uh, 20 millimeters times 60 millimeters cubed all over 12. And that's going to be a bigger number because the 60 gets cubed, not the, tw the, the 20, right? So, uh, so what I'm going to find here, I'm going to go to 60 and I'm going to get 360,000 uh, millimeters to the fourth. Okay, so that gives us the, that gives us some things, and then all we have to do really is is we have all our values. We just need to get the right units and and use uh, or apply our equation, right? So we're gonna get PCRY and PCRX. I'm just gonna make a little bit of room here, and I'm gonna say well PCRY, the critical buckling load, for Y is gonna be pi squared E, which is gonna be two hundred thousand. I'm just gonna do megapascals or newtons per uh, millimeters squared times what was it it was pi squared ei over kl squared so times um i which is forty uh, thousand millimeters to the fourth okay and then we're going to divide that by kl squared so we're going to have 1.5 or 1500 millimeters to the fourth so i'm doing a conversion on the fly there but uh 1500 millimeters to the fourth Okay, so what do we get? Well, let's plug it in because I don't remember. So pi squared uh, times 20, no, not 20, 200,000, pi squared times 200,000, times 40,000. So big numbers, but it's either really big numbers or really small numbers of the meters. I like the big numbers, but some people like them smaller. I don't know. And so what do I get? I get like um, something that doesn't make sense. So what did I do wrong? Uh oh. Um, I don't know. I probably did something wrong. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. It's not 1500 to the fourth. It's over KL squared. There it is. It's a KL squared. Uh, I was getting too many fourths going on in here. That's a square. Um, it also helps on the FE when you write down a formula to actually use that formula. <laughs> just, just saying. It's going to help. So the nice thing with your calculator is if you get a weird number, you can just go back to second enter and, and sort of change it around here and, you know. And then I get the 35,000. That, that makes more sense. So PCRY equals about 35, you know, 100 newtons. Uh, 35,100 newtons. Okay. 
So we could just stop and say, great, we got 35. But what if, what if the strong axis, because it's got that longer three meter length, what if the strong axis actually buckles in 10 kilonewtons? Then we'd feel really sad because we'd get the problem wrong. So let's go and get that. Let's just, I mean, it doesn't take that much longer to do this, right? Let's do PCRX and just confirm that that's not the 10, you know, 10 kilonewtons and uh, be on our way. So pi squared times 200,000 newtons per millimeter squared times 360, the thousand millimeters to the fourth divided by that KL squared, and we'll get it right this time. So 3,000 millimeters squared. So PCRX, is this gonna be smaller than PCRY? If it is, it'll buckle that way. Which which one is it? So um, the nice thing is with your calculator, you can do is you can just go back to the previous one that you just did and modify them, or you can just plug it in all again. I mean, it's it's up to you how you like to use your your calculator. But this is where it's like it's helpful to get a calculator that you like and do what I call um, calculator practice. Just plug these things in and see if you can get the same the same values. Because what I get here is is roughly seventy nine thousand newtons. Okay, and conceivably you could have a problem where you have, you know, more weak axis bracing and the strong axis actually controls. Or you could have something where maybe the X and the Y are closer and the strong axis controls as well. So it's not going to be a given that the, the weak axis controls. Most of the time, that's what it's going to be. Uh, but, but for here, you know, the, the value of 35,000 uh, newtons or 35 kilonewtons is what's going to happen. Okay. So, I mean, if you had a smaller H, maybe the strong axis would control. It's just, it, it depends, you know, on the, on the values that you're given. But this is where understanding kind of this value, understanding some of these values is going to be helpful. So you got L, you got K, you got the I, you got PCR. And then, again, just, just to throw this one out there, because this, this can show up too. If you get the buckling stress, so stress, um, is, stress is dependent on kl over r which is your slenderness ratio and you just have to remember what's our r equals the square root of i over a that's the radius of gyration and it i mean for for like the weak axis for example what would this be it would just be oh we'd have we'd have uh, forty thousand millimeters to the fourth divided by its area of what 60 millimeters times 20 millimeters and take the square root of all that. And you might be saying, Matson, why are you doing that? Because um, didn't we just already solve this problem? Yeah, this is just extra. This is just like extra. This is like a bonus. And the reason, you know, the extra, and I'm just gonna say, you know, needed uh, for buckling stress, right? And the other reason it might be needed is because I was talking to somebody, they're like, yeah, they asked for radius of gyration. Man, they, so, so what's radius of gyration? It's the square root of I over A. Okay, so the question is, why did I pick the, uh, um, the why did I pick the, the, the weak axis over the strong axis in this case? Why did I pick the 35 kilonewtons versus the 79 kilonewtons? Before I get there, I'm just going to do this math out real quick. So if I do the square root of 40,000 uh, divided by 60 divided by 20, I mean, a value of like a radius duration of like 5.77 inches. Okay, so that's just a little tidbit. You'd, you'd need that value if you're doing the buckling stress. So I just wanted to throw that one out there so you have it. Nothing you need it for this one. So why did I pick PCRY over PCRX? So let's just come back up here for a second and think about this. As you're loading this thing, this column gets one axial load. It gets one axial load P. So the question is, when is it going to buckle? It's going to buckle when, I mean, if we we're taking a look at papers, right? It's going to buckle. Like, do you see this? This is going to buckle eventually. In, it's never going to buckle in a strong axis with a piece of paper. It's just going to buckle in the weak axis, right? It, but if we brace it in the middle, it's not oh, a piece of paper so thin. It's still going to buckle in that weak axis. It's conceivable if you, you brace this one in the weak axis, it's conceivable that this strong axis could buckle first. But if we think about it like this, we have one common load P that's being pushed down here. If the buckling load for you know, this side is 35 kilonewtons, the buckling load here is 79 kilonewtons, we're never gonna make 79 kilonewtons because at 35, it's gonna buckle. Does that make sense? So it's already gonna be buckled 
before he can even make it to the 79. So the 35 is going to control. So I hope that answers the question. Uh, but, you know, if not, definitely put some more things out there. I, I'd love to try to, to answer if I can. Okay. The smallest load, perfect. Yeah, I love that answer. The smallest load that will cause buckling. Okay. Awesome. Oh man, let's go back to structural determinacy and we will just keep moving on here. Structural determinacy, stability, analysis of beams, trusses, frames. I mean, we're on question six. We thought we were going to get done early. Uh, hopefully we can still get done early here, but let's look at this. Maybe I'm just talking too much. Doing too many extra things like radius of gyration. <sighs> structural determinacy. So if I just search determinacy, right? Can I, did I do the right word? Um, indeterminate, indeterminacy. Uh, what else do I get? Determinant classifications of structures. So this is interesting because I give you, you know, this is one of those things I sort of throw into my structural analysis class just to kind of get the idea of what determinacy is. It's, it's not something you necessarily always do when you're working in the real world, but it's one of those things that you have to understand whether structure is stable. It's, I'm saying it's unstable, it's stable and determinate. In other words, you can determine everything just by using the equations of equilibrium or it's indeterminate and you can you throw up your hand and say, I can't determine it. Get it? Um, so, so I can't determine it in the sense that the equations of equilibrium aren't enough to determine everything. So we can do this with trusses, we can do it with frames. And what normally that I like to, to do here is, is I, I sort of take this a, a step back. I mean, three times the number of joints plus C, all right? So 3M plus R. Um, normally I think of it a little bit differently than that. Uh, so, oh man, Let, let's just take a look back over here. Normally when I'm looking at structural determinacy, what I know is I have three equations of equilibrium. Some forces X, some forces Y, and some of moments. For every beam, if I have three unknowns, I can solve that beam just using those three equations. If I don't have those beams, it's an indeterminate structure and it's going to be harder. You're going to have to use some other method. Okay. But what I like to think of is, is specifically here, I'll just write out the, the notes again here for a second. But if, if I have, basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to count the number of beams. So I'm going to say, uh, you know, I, I'm going to look at um, the reactions. So if I, if, I, if I look at the number of reactions, and if that is equal to three times the number of beams, it's going to be statically determinate as long as it's stable. So this question says, which of the structures below are both stat stable and statically determined? This might be one of those alternative types of questions where you just have to click and you have to click, ah, which ones do I click? There's six of them. I can't just pick A. And this is, this is one of those annoying ones where it's like, you don't know and you can't just pick B because B is the answer that I like to use the most. I don't know. You know, it's like you can't pick C. C's the, the, the uh the 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 common answer i don't know so what you have to do is you have to kind of understand this. so when i see these structures what i do is i like to just sort of draw in reaction forces instead of support symbols so i'm going to draw in one reaction force here for that roller i'm going to draw in two forces at the pin because remember those forces on either side of the pin are equal and opposite i'm going to draw in another reaction force at a roller and two more uh at a pin i like to draw uh, the ones at the pin as vertical and horizontal normally. But then what I like to do is just go back and count them up. One, two, three, four, five, six. So I've got six, um, six reactions. So this is kind of like if we think of it like this, six reactions, six R. And that is, is that equal to or greater than or less than three times the number of beams? So I've got one beam here and two second beam here. So I've got th three times two beams equals six. So this structure is technically statically determined. You can determine every support reaction, pin reaction just by using the equations of equilibrium. So that checks this structure is statically determinant and you would circle this or put this down as statically determinant. Okay, good. So now that we've done that, let's let's apply our algorithm to the same thing. We've got a roller, we've got a roller, we've got a roller. Great, so we can count these up. We've got one, two, three. So we got, you know, we got one beam. 
Okay, so this is great. We got, we got what? We got three reactions. Is that equal to three times our one beam? Yes, so three times three equals three, you know, whatever, three equals three. What's the problem? The problem is any force, what do rollers do? The problem is oh, rollers roll things, right? The problem is any force on this thing in the horizontal direction is going to make this beam just roll away. And even though we got three equals three, this is just means this one is going to be what? This is bad because this is unstable, right? There's nothing resisting the horizontal forces. This is unstable and it's a big fat no. Okay, it's not stable and steadily determined. Okay, let's go to the next one. And again, I just like to sort of apply this. So I got one, two, three, one, two, three. So every fixed reaction is gonna have three. How do you prove it? You don't, you just have to look at it. I mean, it's like this is, yeah, this isn't like a prove or unproof thing. It's just a, a thing thing. Um, so we got one, two, you know, one, two, and uh, what do we got? Uh, one, two, three. Actually, there is a way to prove it. Uh, uh, maybe I'll show that to you in a second. Hold on. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Anytime we don't get a multiple of three, we're, we should just stop and think for a second. But here, how many beams do we have? We have one, two, three beams. So what do we get? We get how many reactions? We have ten reactions. We got we got three times. Well, actually, we got um, ten reactions, and three times three is nine. You know, um, nine equations, and ten is bigger than nine. So that means this is statically indeterminate to the first degree. Okay, so the, the, I just raised SI to the first degree, but also that means this is not statically determinate. Okay, how do we prove this one here? Um, one of the things is if you sum forces, in the, I mean, honestly, if, if you sum forces in the X direction, and let's say we put this force P here, we sum forces in the X direction equals zero, P, does not equal zero. We know that P is some value and P doesn't equal zero. P is the only force in the X direction. It's not being resisted by anything. So that means it's gonna move. There's gonna be some mass times acceleration. It's not static anymore. Does that make sense? So that's one way I'd, I'd say you could prove that one. Okay, let's keep going here. So we've got a roller, a pin. Uh, so we're rocking and rolling here. One, you know, we got rocking and rolling and we're good. So um, let's just count these up. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, seven. Did I count all those right? No, I missed one. I missed one in here. I got I got an eighth one in here that I, I missed. I got a two at the pin. Okay, so I got eight reactions. Eight. Uh, actually, let me just switch colors here. So I've got eight reactions. Maybe. Um, eight reactions which is less than, uh, how many beams do we have? We have one, two, three beams, less than nine. That means this is just unstable. You don't have to do anything else. We don't have enough reactions. I mean, honestly, you can just look at this one and hopefully see that this thing is unstable, right? Because this pin, this, uh, this thing is just gonna wanna collapse. It's a collapsible mechanism, okay? So if you have got a collapsible mechanism, you don't even have to keep going because it's just gonna collapse and that's unstable. So let's keep going though and figure out what we're doing next. We got a roller, we got a pin, a roller has one, a pin has two, a fixed connection has three reactions. So uh, we can do the same thing kind of going here. We got one, two, three, four, five, six. This is looking good. We got a multiple of three. How many beams do we have? We have one, two beams. So that means we get six reactions. This is equal to three times two, three times two, that equals six. And this one is statically determinate. So we got another one that's good. And then lastly, we're just gonna go here. So we got, uh, you know, one reaction there, one reaction at this roller. So sometimes you can have rollers that connect things rather than pins, but this is a, you know, this is, this is another one. And then two, three, four, five. So, so this again, we can see, hopefully you can see one, two, three, four, five reactions. Five reactions. Which is less than, uh, how many beams do we have? We have one beam and a second beam. 
Uh, so we got three times two, it's less than six. So that's gonna be also unstable. So we got a couple that are, we got a number of them that here that are unstable. I mean, with this one even, um, what you could see is you have kind of a, uh, you have a rotational instability here. If you think of it like that, there's a rotational instability as well. So when we're all said and done, we get two that are statically determinate. We got two that we can, we can deal with. Okay, so, so sometimes, I mean, it's just, it's, it's getting those numbers down, but hopefully you can get a little bit of this where like you start thinking like, okay, statically determinate, and you don't have to write these things down. You're just thinking, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, and you can just say six, and there's two beams, six equals six, we're good. Okay, are they gonna ask you all this? Maybe, maybe not. Could you do a similar thing with trusses? Yes, you could. This is kind of the big picture, how to look at it though. Okay. Got three questions left. Let's let's keep going here. And this might be the hardest one of the three questions. I don't know. Maybe it's not. But oh man, actually, when I first saw it, when I first was reading through the FE spec, and I saw determinacy and stability analysis, this just brought me back to consulting, where we did stability analysis to the dam sections for a living. I mean, like we get paid money to do this stuff. I'm not joking. I'm not making it up. You get paid money to check to see if a dam is stable. Okay, I, I way oversimplified this stability analysis because I just, just said don't assume any uplift. Okay, but yeah, is that a real? Is that real? Probably not. But let's just go with it for this this question. Okay, the question says we have a concrete dam section below. Unit weight's 150 pounds per cubic foot. Unit weight of water is 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. Assume the coefficient of friction between the base. So down here, the base. And the ground is 0.35 and uplift is not a consideration so we're not i mean maybe when we get to geotech we'll deal with some of those flow nets uplift all that fun stuff but we're not going to deal with uplift right now okay stability analysis of the dam section based only on the weight of concrete and lateral water pressure indicates the dam will most likely do what it'll resist sliding and resist overturning it'll do none of the above and it'll fail and fail i don't know so basically we have to check two things we have to check Sliding and we have to check overturning. Okay, is this doable? I think it is. Let's take a look though and see. So if I just redraw my dam section here for a second. So eh, I could, probably could have drawn that better. What forces, I mean, we're, we're, let's think free body diagram for a second. What forces do we have acting on this? We have some water force. We've got some concrete weight, right? In the concrete weight, I'm gonna break up into kind of two sections here. I'm gonna break up into uh, you know this this maybe this this rectangular section and then the other section I'm going to do here is going to be kind of this triangular section because the weight's going to vary so if we think about this we have to think about well how much does this thing weigh how much does this thing weigh and the way that I think about it is it it's sort of kind of kind of sort of actually it's just like if we have a uniform load up here and a in a you know horizontal load or I'm sorry a linearly sloping load here those are kind of the forces that are holding this thing down. Now what's what's pushing back? Obviously there's gonna be some normal force, there's gonna be some friction force. Okay. So let's just see what's going on. So uh, let's take a look at this and see uh, how, how this works, right? So, um, so as we get started here, we have to find a couple things. We have to find this pressure down here. What's that pressure? Do you remember, do you remember it's gamma water times H? remember that um what's the what's the pressure so to speak of this this concrete weight the concrete weight is just going to be the gamma concrete times its age its height right so that's going to give us these these pressure values so if we if we think of this you know this one what's that well we have 62.4 pounds per cubic foot so let's go to a one foot section what do we get we get 62.4 times What's the height of the water? The height of the water is 24. So 62.4, uh, let me just write this in. 62.4 times uh, 24 feet. What's that gonna equal? It's gonna be about 1500, 1498, 1498. What's that, pounds per square foot? Okay, and then if we do the same thing for the concrete, what's the concrete? The concrete's gonna be 150 pounds per cubic foot times its height, its height is actually a little bit different. It's gonna be 26. Uh, so maybe there's some gates in this dam and the, the water's not going over it. Okay, 
So let's look at it. 150 times 62.4 is going to be 93. I'm sorry, I did that wrong. 150 times, I wrote down 26. I said the, the wrong thing. This is going to equal 3,900 pounds per square foot. And if we think of a one foot section, this becomes pounds per foot. Okay, so nothing super crazy there. And now all we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out what these forces are. So we know that we're going to have some resultant kind of forces here. We're going to have this horizontal force. We're going to have this, the weight of the concrete one, you know, kind of like weight of concrete two. I'll just do it like that. But let's, let's figure out what those forces are. So H is going to be what? It's just going to be this, this pressure of the water, right? Times its height again, times one half. So this is going to be one half of what? 14. 98. I'm going to change this to pounds per foot to do a one foot section, just a one foot section. I'm going to multiply it by one foot to just do a one foot section of the dam. And then I'm going to multiply this by um, 24 feet its height again to get that H force. So if I do that, uh, 0 0.5 times 14.98 uh, times 24 is going to be like 17.976. So almost 18,000. I'm just going to call that, I'm just going to call that 18,000 and just round it off. 18,000 pounds. Okay, let's look at the weight of the concrete. One, what's that? It's just gonna be this, this 3.9 kips times, how far does that act over? It acts over eight feet. So times eight feet equals what? So 3.9 uh, times eight is 31.2 kips. Okay, so I'm just doing conversion on the fly here a little bit to go from pounds to kips, right? 1,000 pounds per kip. And then this WC2, what's the weight of the kind of the, the triangular section? So this is going to be similar. It's going to be one half of 3.9 times, uh, it's not eight feet anymore. Now the, the length of that triangular section is 15 feet and kips per foot. I should probably put in here kips per foot. Uh, so what do we get? So one half, so 0.5 times the 3.9 times 15, and I get like 29.3 roughly, so 29. 0.3 kips. So these are kind of the, the components of forces in that free body diagram. So now let's now that we have those, let's tackle this a little bit, right? So let's just start with sliding, right? So so for sliding, this is kind of a statics problem. I mean, it's this is honestly a statics problem. It, the stability, stability analyses are kind of just like let's let's do statics but for sliding what do we what do we want we want or what we want is this thing to be stable so for it to be stable what we want is the horizontal driving forces so the horizontal forces you know the driving maybe I could just put driving forces has to be less than what the friction force at the base to resist sliding, right? So this has to be true to resist sliding. Does that make sense? So the water that's trying to push this has to be less than the friction that's available so that this thing resists sliding. Okay, so what's the horizontal force? The horizontal force is just this 18,000 pounds, right? So the horizontal force is easy. This is just the, the driving force is H equals 18, uh, I'm just going to convert here 18 kips. We already know that. It's the, it's the water force trying to push this thing. Is that less than the friction at the base? Well, what's the friction at the base? The friction at the base is developed how? The friction at the base is equal to mu times the normal force, right? So what's this? We were told that the, the frictional coefficient was 0.35 in the problem above times what? The sum of the vertical forces, essentially. The sum of the force in the y direction. You catch that? So, so just like friction and statics, it's the same type of thing. What do we get? We get equal to 0 0.35 times, oh, what's 31, what's, what do we get when we add this up? 31.2 plus 29.3 is going to be 60.5. And when we do that out, we get 0 0.35 times 60, uh, 0.5, and I get like 21.2 kips. So the force of friction, is 21.2, which is indeed greater than our horizontal force. So this structure, therefore, stable in sliding. Okay.
so it's stable and sliding it's not going to go anywhere the the friction and you might be saying well is this going to is the, is the friction going to push it back and no the only, the only you only get as much friction as you need if it, if the horizontal force is bigger than 21 then there'd be a problem but i've never seen a dam go travel back upstream into the into the river because friction pushed it up there right the only problem you get is when the water pushes it down right so the only problem you get is when this horizontal force is bigger okay so it is stable and sliding so that means uh, we can just go and cross out the fail and sliding, fail and sliding. Okay, so we know it's going to resist sliding. And then let's take a look at overturning. So what's overturning here? So overturning. You guys doing okay? I mean, you guys probably are sitting there with like dinner. But who knows? Maybe, maybe, maybe not. But so what do we have? We have overturning. What do we want for overturning? So let's take a look at this. And basically what we want here is, is we want the overturning moments. We want, you know, to, to be stable. We want this to be less than uh, the resisting moments. So in other words, we want more holding it down than trying to turn it over. Okay. So what do we get? Well, what's, what overturning moment do we have here? Well, the only thing that's trying to turn this over, right, is this horizontal force. The horizontal force is trying to totally push it over. Okay, what's trying to hold it down? The, the weight of the concrete is trying to hold it down. Does that make sense? So, so basically, we get two moments from the weight of the concrete, and somebody's probably out there saying, well, what about the normal force? Well, eh, technically, the normal force doesn't really work if the water's too big so the, the there isn't a, if the water starts to overturn it too much your, your normal force goes sort of goes away but we'll uh we'll go from there so let's let's just look at those two sets of moments and see which one's bigger and then we know if it's going to be stable so let's look at the overturning moment so what's that it's going to be the horizontal force times its moment arm so what's its moment arm it's just going to be, you know, one third of this distance or 24 feet. What's this? 24 feet over three, which is going to equal what? Eight feet. OK, and this is where uplift really comes in. But we're, we're just ignoring uplift on this one because that's what the problem says. So 24 or 18 times this, this, this uh, eight feet. So this is 18 kips times eight feet. So if I plug that in, what do I get? 18 times eight. Is 144 did I do that right I think so I don't know let me let me check my answers here uh, but hopefully it makes a little bit of sense yeah that's the number I got it's just a I, I had remembered a different number but who knows 144 hippie so that's that that looks good the resisting moments what it's gonna be WC1 times its moment arm and um you know and we're going to add in wc2 times its moment arm and let's go find those moment arms and then we'll we'll figure out whether this thing's stable or not so the moment arm for wc1 we're going all the way here to point a right this is point a what's that distance well to get to you know if i come to my big diagram here this thing's going to be right at the middle of that eight feet so to get to there i need to come all the way to here so it's that 15 plus 8 over 2 do you see it it's this whole 15 plus half the 8 so 15 plus half the 8 that's going to be 19 feet and then similarly we're going to have this weight of the concrete here which is just going to be two-thirds of that 15 so two-thirds of that 15 this is going to be 10 feet so we have that 19 feet we have got 10 feet so this is going to be 19 feet this is going to be 10 feet we can plug and chug this one out and if i put the wc1 in i think this was like what 29 I don't remember. I got to go look back. Oh, right, no, we got the 31.2 uh, times 19 feet uh, plus, what, 29.3 kips times 10 feet. And hopefully you can see that this is just going to be a lot bigger. Uh, but the value I got was like 885 or something like that, 885 uh, kip feet. And, and this is a lot bigger than our overturning moments. So that means that this is going to be, therefore, I'm going to say I'm um, stable in overturning and yeah stability analysis get more complicated especially when you start looking at uplift assumptions i, I mean the the FERC guidelines for uplift have changed uh, you know at various points over the the course of the past 50 years but it, but what we have here is is an answer that we're going to resist sliding and resist overturning 
and we're stable. Okay. Are we going to get a question that that's that that's this crazy? Probably not. But you know, I it just brings me back to the fun of consulting. So let's let's go from there. So let's keep going. We got two more questions. These two are are kind of on the sort of quicker side, but elementary statistically or i'm sorry statically indeterminate structures so elementary is good we like elementary uh we, we like things not to be too crazy but what we see here is if we start looking at remember determinacy we start looking at this we got one two three four we got four reactions but only one beam that means it's statically indeterminate we have too many reactions for what we are trying to do so this is statically indeterminate okay so we need to go ahead and solve this one so Let's go back to our reference handbook. And this is where in the reference handbook, we actually have uh, some things that are going to help us here. I, I threw this one in just because I think it's, it's super, super useful. But here we have elementary statically indeterminate structures. My force method of analysis, right? So here what this is saying is it's saying like, let's take this, 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 this roller out at first. And we have some basic beam formulas for what this looks like. So 5WL to the fourth over 3D, 4EI. This is some basic beam formulas for the deflection at the middle of this beam without that roller support. And then the question is, what force do we need to push back up on that thing to get these two deflections to equal each other? So essentially all that we're doing is we're gonna set this deflection, uniform load, without that, that roller, equal to th this deflection, you know, this is the point load to push it back to zero okay so if we know those two are going to work basically all that we're doing here is we're, we're going to equate those two and uh push them uh back together okay so uh that's that's what we're going to do so let's write that equation down and solve it so if we come back here we're going to say five let me get the right color here uh but we'll say five wl to the fourth over 384 ei equals PL cubed over 48 EI. And this is so cool because somebody, I, I know somebody probably because we have a, we're given a steel beam here, somebody probably went and looked that up in the manual and said, well, I'm gonna go find I. But the good news is, look at this, look at this. E and I both cancel out. In fact, not only E and I cancel out, but we have three of the L's that cancel out. So when we look at this, what, what we're left with is just five W L over 384 equals p over 48 you see it so so this gives us something but what, what are we asking for the magnitude of the vertical support reaction a so so we need a but this is going to give us b okay this is going to give us b so p in this case equals this is the reaction at b okay that's going to be helpful to us because we need to get there first and this is how we're going to go through this process. So we're going to start with this and we're going to just plug in. So five times W, which is two kips per foot times the length. The length is going to be the total length of 18 feet uh, divided by 384 equals P or I'm just going to call this BY, right? This is, this is really that reaction BY. Okay. So BY uh, over 48 and rather than doing over 48, I'm going to cross multiply by 48 and just put the 48 on this side. So now I can directly solve for BY. So BY is going to equal, if I did this right, let's look 48 times five times two times 18 divided by 384. I got 22.5. Anybody else get 22.5, uh, 22.5 kips. So that means this, this, you know, this force in the middle is um, 22.5 kips. And then we've got two forces here. And this is symmetric too. So, so what you see here is this A, Y, and C, Y, due to symmetry, they're going to be the same. And how much total force do we have acting down? Well, two kips per foot times 18 feet equals what? So two times 18 gives us a total of 36 kips. So now we have one thing left to do. All that we really have left to do is we, we just have to say, okay, let's, um, let's go here and let's just sum forces in the Y direction. Come on, not wanting to click for me. Um, we can sum forces in the Y direction. Sum forces in the Y direction equals zero. 
And what do we get, right? So we get AY, essentially AY. I'm just gonna say two AY, because AY, you know, by symmetry, AY equals CY. Two AY plus 22.5 kips minus this 36 kips equals zero. So we get AY equal to what? 36 minus 22.5. Uh, divided by two and I get a y equal to 6.75 kips which fortunately for us is also uh, an answer here okay so I will highlight that and be happy with it so again what we got to do here is we have to we have to know kind of like where to how to deal with these elementary statistics statically indeterminate structures um, we have to recognize we can't just take like a tributary area here okay um, we can't just take like a tributary area uh, and and solve this sorry my, my mouse stopped clicking this is just annoying me but um like we can't just take like oh well we're gonna take four and a half times two and that would give us nine kips which would be uh, which would be wrong right so if we do uh, the nine kips that's wrong right four and a half times two that's an easy answer to get but it's the wrong answer so don't so don't go down that path it's not just a tributary width you know half the distance 4.5 and, and and that's because the the force at this middle support does uh does get a little bit bigger based on the 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 way that this beam um acts continuously okay so let's keep going. We got one question and then we will uh, be done if, let's see if my computer wants to respond here. Maybe. <laughs> well, uh, if not, we'll, we'll come back and do this one another day. Um, or I'll, I'll shut it down and restart it. I don't know. But um, let's look and see if I can make this happen. We got one left. And uh, it's not liking me here. Okay. Um, maybe. Okay, I think we're I think we're making it work. Okay. Uh there we go. Sorry about that. Let's see if we can make this work here. Okay, so statically indeterminate structure. So again, we have a beam. We've got a statically indeterminate structure here. We've got too many reactions. We've got three fixed reactions on one side, three on the other side. We only got one beam. And we gotta we have to figure out how to solve this so again when we come to our 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 problem here what we're going to do is well let's just first draw a free body diagram and see what this free body diagram looks like so if we take this thing um i'm going to draw my free body diagram i got what a y b y uh a x uh b x and some of you are just tempted to stop right there because it looks easy but don't do it because it's going to cause you problems okay uh don't do that it, it's not going to work but what we can do here is we have to remember don't forget your mother didn't i say that already um but what we have is some moments here sometimes you'll see this mab and mba depending on your sign naming convention but you have to deal with those moments so you can't just take like some moments about point a and solve because we have these two fixed end moments that we don't know so that should ring a bell, right? When I say fixed end moments, that should ring a bell that there are fixed end moment sheets. Do you remember those? So if we come back, and again, we're back into this, this the reference handbook. If we come back into here, uh, we have some fixed end moment sheets. And I can hopefully find this. Can I? There it is. We get, uh, the cool thing is, like maybe the, the book we use is has like a whole table of them, right? The, 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 uh, reference handbook only has like two fixed end moment sheets so if you're looking for a big long table they're not going to be there this only has two so we got wl squared over 12 for uniform load with between fixed supports and we got pab squared over l squared and pa squared b over l squared that's it and you might be thinking like that's great mark but um this asked for a vertical reaction it didn't ask for a moment in order to get the vertical reaction, you have to find the moments first. So uh, if we take a look at these, we're going to have formulas P. I, I think this was P. Um, P A B squared over L squared and P, uh, P B A squared over L squared. 
So those are those moments. And this shouldn't be super, super tricky uh, to plug in. Um, we should be able to plug those in right away and solve. So let's, let's, this is gonna give us our moments, which we'll then use to go get our vertical force. So let's, let's just plug in here. And what do we get? We get nine times, nine kilonewtons newtons times A. Which one's A? Okay, so if we come back to our diagram here, A is on the left, B is on the right. So A is going to be on the left, this is going to be A, this is going to be B. Uh, so what do we have? We have 5 meters times 10 meters squared divided by 15 meters, the total length squared. And we can just keep coming down here and, and solve what's 9 uh, times 5 times 10 times 10 divided by 15 squared. So I got like 20 kilonewton meters here. So that's the moment at AB. Okay, and then on the other side, uh, let's do the other side here. So P, 9 kilonewtons times 10 meters times 5 meters uh, squared all over 15 meters. Uh, and we'll square that. So if I plug that in, 9 times 10 times 5 squared uh, divided by 15 squared. I get 10, the moment at BA is 10 kilonewton meters. Once you have that, what are what are we finding? We're finding the the um, the reaction at support A. Okay, so the good news is if we have the reaction at support A, we can sum moments at point B. Normally, I like to sum moments at A. If you like to sum moments at A, go ahead, sum moments at A, and then sum forces. But here, I'm just going to sum moments at point B. This is going to equal zero. Anything that's that's you know in this direction is going to be positive. So I'm going to start with M A B. That's a positive. Okay, this one's positive. Then I'm going to have minus a y times 15 meters the whole the whole distance here and then i've got this nine kilonewtons so i'm going to add in nine kilonewtons times 10 meters i'm going kind of fast with those signs there but again rotation it's causing counterclockwise rotation which is positive positive. and then what else the only other thing that causes a moment here is mba and i'm going to say minus mba because that's causing clockwise rotation it has to equal zero we got one unknown and we're done. Okay, so we got one unknown. Let's go solve it, send it, crush it, and uh, I don't know, <laughs> go win the gold. Um, so what do we got? We got MAB, which is 20 kilonewton meters. I'm gonna put this whole term kind of on the other side of the zero, um, it, just to make it easier. Times nine kilonewton. Actually, I'm just gonna say nine times ten is what 90 kilonewton meters, and then minus this 10 kilonewton meters. Uh, equals what a y times 15 meters and so we're gonna get a y equal to what's this we got 20 it actually works out kind of nicely doesn't it 20 plus 90 minus 10 that's 100 divided by 15 is going to be what 6.7 uh, kilonewtons so and most nearly most nearly we're in between the the six and the seven but most nearly is going to get us to seven Okay, so, oh man, elementary st statically determinate structures, did we have to do like moment distribution or like, you know, some other crazy, crazy method? No, we didn't here, but we did have to understand that that moment or the fixed end moment diagram up here, right up there. We had to understand that diagram. We understand how to put it in, how to solve it, but also what to do with it once we did. So, man, there's so much in, in structural analysis I wish I could teach a whole course on it. Actually, um, I do, but that's, you know, it is what it is. It, it's, it's in structural analysis, you're probably going to end up using more reference handbook resources to a certain degree than in statics, right? You're going to have to go look up some moments of inertia. You're going to have to um, maybe do some more unit conversions and that sort of thing. But that reminds me of a story, okay? This is all done. Actually, uh, this reminds me of a story. My, my grandpa, he's like 100 now, like literally, like legitimately 100. He sends jokes every once in a while. And, um, and he, he sent this joke. So Matt, to answer your question, yes, this is totally, I could totally see this question on the FE, 100%, like this type of thing. This is an elementary, statically indeterminate structure. I could totally see something like this on there. I, I don't know. They give you these these ref, these formulas. I could totally see something like that. It's not super crazy, um, but in, in case you don't have resources, you might think of 
this gentleman um this is for my grandpa there's a gentleman who um who was sent to jail and, and he was really sad because his dad uh had always planted a garden his dad was getting older and he normally dug the garden up for him uh, but he couldn't because he was in jail but he still was able to use his resources because he um he, he sent his dad he said well his dad sent him a letter and said hey i'm feeling pretty bad because i can't dig up my garden i'm getting too old and if you were here not in jail you could do it so his son sent him a letter he said dad dad don't dig up the garden that's where i buried the bodies love your son um well at 4 a.m the next morning fbi agents and local police arrived and dug up the entire garden without finding any bodies um they, they apologized and to the old man and left um the same day the old man received another letter from his son it read dear, dear dad go ahead and plant tomorrow um the garden should be dug up now it's the best thing can do under the circumstances I gotta love my grandpa. You know what? That that guy was resourceful. Even though he's in prison, he uh <laughs> he made use of it. Um, honestly, you guys are resourceful. I know you can do this. This this type of question isn't too crazy. It's something you can make work. But oh man, I, I appreciate you tuning in here and going through some of these problems with me. And uh, hopefully, if nothing else, the joke is worth it. You know, I'll, I'll try to come up with a good joke. Maybe it's not good, but it's uh it should be fun. So. Hey, um, if you guys have questions or you're in my actual class here, feel free to stop by tomorrow. I've got some time in the middle of the day, so I'd be happy to, to chat with you. But, um, you know, we can, uh, we can go from there. So next week we'll be doing structural design. We'll get into the, some of the concrete steel design and then just keep going. So, hey, thanks guys for tuning in. <laughs> I know, isn't it crazy? It's something so stupid. <laughs> could be funny but uh enjoy 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 thanks for uh tuning in with me and uh i'll see you next week so till next time guys keep working hard moving onward and upward